this week in environmental science, we'll be looking at chapter three, titled Evolution, Biodiversity, and Population Ecology. It's a general run through of those three topics. Our objectives for this lecture are to understand natural selection, how evolution influences biodiversity, reasons for species extinction, ecological organization, population characteristics, and population ecology. Our central case study in this chapter is about Hawaii's native forest birds. In this case, we're taking a look at one of the specific honey creeper birds that is endemic to Hawaii, endemic meaning that it's only found there. It's called the Akia Pola Ao or we'll just say the Aki for short. Honey creepers are sparrow-sized birds that exist only on the Hawaiian Islands. The Hawaiian Islands are volcanic islands that exist in the Pacific Ocean, and the honey creeper birds that are there today descended from a common ancestor that arrived there. The honey creeper birds are a classic example of what's called divergent evolution where from a common ancestor stems many descendants that exist today that have spread out into different niches and have uh, built up different adaptations over time and changed into new species. Again, these are called endemic birds, meaning they only exist in this area. Unfortunately, as humans have moved into the Hawaiian Islands and have brought their domesticated animals, as well as rats and other non-native species, these birds, as well as other endemic species, are very, very threatened, as well as some have gone extinct because of this. Humans have cut down trees, they've introduced non-native animals, and have brought disease to these areas. Refuge managers and conservation biologists are working hard to protect these forests and to stop the extinction of the remaining birds and other endemic species. Jack Jeffrey is a scientist mentioned in our case study. He's a biologist that's been, been, been there for about 20 years leading innovative projects to save native plants and birds from extinction. Staff and volunteers here have fenced out pigs and planted thousands of native plants in the areas deforested by cattle grazing. Young has restored native forests and is now regro regrowing thousands of acres. However, today global climate change is presenting new challenges. As temperatures climb, mosquitoes move upslope and malaria and pox spread deeper into the forest so that even protected areas are no longer immune. The next generation of managers will need to innovate further strategies to fend off extinction for the island's native species. A species is a population or a, a group of populations whose members share characteristics and can breed with each other to produce what's called viable fertile offspring. Meaning when they do mate, they not only produce offspring, but offspring who are able to continue on by producing fertile offspring of their own. A population is a group of individuals of the same species that live in the same area at the same time. Again, in a population, they're all the same species, meaning they can interbreed with each other and produce viable fertile offspring with each other. Evolution is change over time or uh, the change in gene frequencies over time. Evolution is the source of the Earth's biodiversity. Genetic changes often lead to modifications in appearance and behavior. Leading to natural selection. This is the process by, wi by which inherited characteristics that enhance survival and reproduction are passed on more frequently to future generations than those that do not. 
organisms that have adaptations that allow them to survive better in an area will be the ones that get to reproduce, thereby passing on their good adaptations to their offspring, keeping the species going, and creating a population that has certain characteristics in common that make them well adapted to that area. Natural selection is the primary mechanism of evolution and biological diversity. For example, Hawaii hosts a treasure of biological diversity created by evolution by natural selection. Evolution is one of the best supported and most illuminated concepts in science. It is actually the foundation by which all modern biology is built on. And it is vital for a full appreciation of environmental science. After all, organisms are the way they are because of evolution by natural selection. And biodiversity is the way it is today because of evolution by natural selection. Evolutionary processes influence agriculture, pesticide resistance, medicine, and health. For instance, uh, in environmental science, as an example, we may study mosquitoes and we may as humans try to reduce their numbers in certain areas because of maybe some of the different diseases they bring, such as malaria. Therefore, we might use certain pesticides on them. Killing off mosquitoes in an area is affecting the food chain and therefore could have an effect on the environment. Therefore, studying evolution and knowing the effects is very important in environmental science. We may also find that once we use a pesticide on a certain organism like a mosquito, that certain ones will actually survive and have a resistance in the future to these pesticides that work today. This is a great example of evolution by natural selection that we must learn about and keep in mind as we study environmental science. In 1858, both Darwin, Charles Darwin, and Alfred Russell Wallace proposed natural selection as a mechanism of evolution. Both scientists had their own separate studies and arrived at the same conclusions. However, Wallace did state that Darwin's information was actually a bit more complete and therefore Darwin seems to get the credit for natural selection today, though both actually around the same time had the same ideas and same conclusions. Natural selection shapes organisms. It explains nature's patterns. Here's some of the ideas or the premises of natural selection. In order to understand it better, it's important to understand these ideas. First of all, organisms struggle to survive and reproduce. They produce more offspring than can survive. Individuals of a species vary in their characteristics because of genes and the environment. And some individuals are better suited to their environment and reproduce more effectively. So this is how natural selection works. You have a lot of uh, struggle to survive. Therefore, those organisms with the best adaptations are going to be the ones that do survive and then therefore are the ones that get to reproduce and pass on their adaptations to their offspring. Adaptations or adaptive traits are very beneficial or beneficial traits and genes are responsible for these traits. They promote reproductive success. These adaptations come from genes and DNA and are passed along to future generations. Natural selection acts on this genetic variation, these differences in traits. Differences often come from mutations in DNA. These are accidental changes in DNA. Uh, sometimes they can be good, sometimes they can be bad. But the non-lethal mutations provide genetic variation on which natural selection acts. If 
you're unsure what variation is, for instance, in humans, we have a lot of variation that we can physically see, such as the different colors of our hair, different colors of our skin, the different colors of our eyes, different heights. There's also traits we don't really see that are inside of us that are variation. Those are our blood types, such as the A blood type and the B blood type and the O blood type. Those are all variations and have come about by different mutations or changes in DNA over time that nature has selected for. Sexual reproduction also leads to genetic variation and can produce new combinations of traits. Sexual, so, or sexual reproduction is uh, when two organisms of the same species get together and produce offspring. And when they do, they only get to provide half of their genetic material to their offspring. Therefore, you get a new mixing with each generation, a new mixing of traits. Environmental condition determine the pressures of natural selection, such as global warming could be an example, or volcanism. Organisms, though, need time to adapt to changing conditions. I mentioned earlier that the Hawaiian honey creepers are a classic example of what's called divergent evolution. This is when you have your one common ancestor and as time goes by, different species arise from the common ancestor. Each of them have adapted to a different habitat or a different niche with their own special traits that natural selection has selected for. And you can see that here in the diagram of the different niches that honey creepers in Hawaii fulfill. Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands is another classic example of divergent evolution. Divergent evolution is not to be mistaken for instances of what's called convergent evolution. Conversely, sometimes very unrelated species living in similar environments in separate locations, even separate continents, may independently acquire similar traits as they adapt to selective pressures. And that's called convergent evolution. It's nature's way of saying that these traits are just the best for these environments, though they may be far apart from one, each, from one another. Evidence of selection is all around us. Natural selection is evident in every adaptation of every organism. One of the ways that Charles Darwin came up with his idea of natural selection was by studying artificial selection. Natural selection is when nature selects for certain traits, but artificial selection is when humans select for certain traits. Darwin thought if humans can select for traits in organisms and be successful with that, then can't nature do it as well, only on a slower time scale? And definitely the answer is yes. In artificial selection, again, the process of selection conducted is under human direction. For example, dog breeds is a great example of artificial selection. Dog breeds came from the ancestral wolf, Canis lupus. In Darwin's time in England, dogs were kind of the thing. Even Her Majesty the Queen of England had dog breeds. And uh, so that was one of the things that Darwin studied that really gave him some great ideas for his ideas on natural selection. Over here in this diagram gives us a, a great example of how we've derived some different crops through natural selection. Through, natu or through selective breeding, we've created corn with bigger, sweeter kernels wheat and rice with larger and more numerous grains, and apples, pears, and oranges with even better taste. We've diversified single types into many. For instance, from the ancestral plant here, uh, genus Brassica, we've gained cauliflower and broccoli, Russell sprouts, and cabbage. 
all through artificial selection. Understanding evolution is vital for modern society. It plays a key role in our everyday lives, though we don't even realize it. For instance, in the foods we eat, like we've just mentioned, creating the foods that we eat through artificial selection and even being able to have bigger crops through artificial selection to feed more people. In the clothes we wear, many medical advances. We rely on evolution to know which strains of flu are going to be the ones that will be common in order to give flu shots every year to people or to, to see how uh, certain bacteria or viruses may change making us have to have different vaccinations over time or different immunizations. Preventing antibiotic resistance in feedlots, uh, pesticide resistance in crop eating insects, like I gave you the example of the mosquitoes and DDT earlier. Today there's uh, many resistant strains of insects to our pesticides that we use and that's because of evolution. Even technology and engineering solutions have developed as a result of our understanding of evolution and it's a key idea in environmental science. Evolution generates diversity. Biological diversity is also call, called biodiversity. The variety of life across all levels of biological organization from our different genes that we have the different species, the different populations, and different communities. Scientists today have described about 1.8 million species, but many more remain undiscovered or unnamed. Estimates for the actual number of species in the world range from 3 million to possibly up to 100 million species. Some of these places where we discover new species are such lush vegetation areas that in order to walk through these areas you would literally have to cut your path. So humans have not been everywhere to identify all species. And think about all the, the vast oceans that we have yet to explore where we could find more species. Tropical rainforests are another area rich in biodiversity. Hawaii's insect fauna provides some examples of how we have yet to learn a lot and maybe even discover more species. Scientists studying fruit flies on the Hawaiian Islands have described over 500 species of them, but they've also identified about 500 others that have not yet been formally named and described. Still, more fruit fly species probably exist, but have not yet been found. So insects provide some ideas of species that yet we could add to our described species list. Do humans evolve or are humans still evolving is a frequently asked question. And we are animals and just like any other animals, we are subject to natural selection. So the answer to that is yes. However, it's a little more complex when we think of humans evolving today because we have our big brains and are able to solve so many problems through medicine and technology and agriculture there's uh, some more complexity to what's happening to us. Yet we must remember that we are affected by all other organisms on earth and they are evolving as well. Speciation is the process of generating new species. It produces new types of organisms. And there's a few different ways that that normally happens in nature. One of those ways is called allopatric speciation. In Latin, allopatric means other country because it describes how the two species form. We start with a population. Remember, a population is a group of organisms of the same species in the same area who are able to 
interbreed with one, one another successfully to produce viable fertile offspring. So in this example in the picture, we have a species of fruit flies that are living as a population in an area. Then some sort of event happens where there's a physical separation between the population. It could be a river or uh, some sort of continental drift earthquake event that separates the two species. Now, being in two different areas, different natural selection events may happen and may select for different traits in the two populations. Over time, the traits that are different build up to one day where we actually have two separate species, meaning if we were to put them back together again, such as maybe the river dries up between them, those two populations will not any longer recognize each other as the same species. They will no longer get together to mate to create viable fertile offspring. So in other words, this is an example of the origin of two species of fruit flies here, shown in the diagram. We can infer the history of life diversification by comparing organisms. Often we use phylogenetic trees that look like this in the picture in order to visualize it a little bit better. Phylogene phylogenetic trees are branching diagrams that show the relationships among species, groups, and genes, etc., and represent life's history. For instance, if we were looking at this phylogenetic tree here, if you can see my pointer, it's right here. This would be the common ancestor to every organism that's on this particular phylogenetic tree from lampreys all the way down to birds. In this case, the lampreys are what you call the outgroup to everybody. They're the least related to everybody. And this is a great example of divergent evolution as well. And we can see all of these organisms diverging from the common ancestor. Along the way, we may write in certain little characters like this. This is called a derived character, such as the development of jaws, which would be shared by sharks and bony fish and everybody else on this chart. However, because lampreys are the outgroup, they do not have the jaw. Moving further in, we have lungs or swim bladder as a derived character, shared by bony fish and other organisms, but not by sharks and not by lampreys. Moving further on, we see the common characteristic of four legs, such as amphibians and mammals, turtles, snakes, lizards, crocodiles, and birds have, but not lungfish, not bony fish, not sharks, and not lampreys, and so on and so forth as we get all the way to the end here with feathers that only birds have. We can also take a look at this and and see where there's two branches here. These are called sister taxa. We can see crocodiles and birds are very closely related compared to with snakes and lizards, a little bit further. The common ancestor for crocodiles and birds would have occurred here where I have my pointer. But the common ancestor for birds, crocodiles, snakes, and lizards is a little further back, would have been here and the common ancestor with that group, along with turtles, would have been here. And finally, with species of our own kind, mammals, would have been way back here. We also see our derived character of moisture-retaining eggs for terrestrial living in the common ancestor of mammals, turtles, snakes and lizards, crocodiles, and birds. So this is a nice little visual to see divergent evolution occurring and to see who's more closely related to who and when different common ancestors to organisms existed. Taxonomists are scientists who have to name and classify organisms. Remember, as we stated earlier, not all organisms on Earth have been formally named yet. So they may have a busy job if we actually have a hundred million organisms that we have to name.
and we've only done 1.8 million of them. Remember we used the hierarchical classification system with species being the most specific and genus a little less specific. The genus and species making up the scientific name. Less specific yet is the family. Going back further is the order. Back further yet is the class. Phylum, even less specific yet, back to kingdom, and then domain. Domain classification is a little bit newer in the scheme of classifying things than this other seven levels here. For domain, there's three different ones. We belong to the domain eukarya, meaning we have eukaryotic cells or cells that have nuclei. There's also a domain for prokaryotes or bacteria, which do not have a nucleus in their cells, and another type of bacteria called archaea, who also do not have nuclei in their cells. With kingdoms, you may remember there's the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the fungi kingdom, protus kingdom, bacteria kingdom, and the archaea kingdom. In this case, we're using the Hawaiian honey creeper here as our species that we have classified. If this was human classification, our domain would be eukarya, our kingdom animalia, our phylum chordata, meaning we have a backbone. Our class would be mammals. Our order would be primate. Our family would be hominid. Our genus would be homo and our species would be sapiens, being our scientific name would be Homo sapien. The fossil record reveals life's history. Scientists can tell what organisms lived in the past and can compare them to the ones that are alive today using fossils, which is an imprint in stone of a dead organism. The fossil record is the cumulative body of fossils worldwide. One thing's for sure, organisms that lived in the past do not look like the organisms that live today. Phylogenetic trees and the fossil record show that life has existed on Earth for 3.5 billion years. Life evolved complex structures from simple ones. Life evolved large sizes from small ones. But natural selection can also favor simplicity and small size as well. It's not always the large organisms that prevail. Here's how a fossil forms, if you didn't know. As organisms die, some of them get buried by sediment. Under certain conditions, the hard parts of their bodies, like the bones, shells, and teeth, may be pre preserved as sediments are compressed into the rock. Minerals replace the material, leaving behind the fossil. Extinction. Most species that once lived are now gone, actually. From studying fossils, paleontologists calculate that the average time a species spends on Earth is 1 to 10 million years. The number of species in existence at any one time is equal to the number added through speciation minus the number removed by extinction. Biological diversity is now being lost at an astounding rate, though. This loss is irreversible. Scientists have termed what's called a background extinction rate that's always existed for Earth as being about one to five species per year, meaning that it is common for species to become extinct in Earth's past. Again, that's one to five species per year. However, today, scientists propose that we're over 1,000 times that, meaning that dozens of species are going extinct each day. And they propose that it's human caused. Some species are especially vulnerable to extinction due to rapid environmental changes because of human influence. 
climate change, changing sea levels, severe weather, the arrival of new species, etc. And these are endemic species that are especially vulnerable, like the Hawaiian honey creepers from our story at the beginning of the chapter. Endemic species, again, exist in only a certain specialized area. They're very susceptible to extinction because they're very adapted to their environment. And when things change, they may not have the adaptations to be able to withstand that change and therefore go extinct. Often their populations are usually small as well. Again, the background extinction rate should happen very slowly, maybe one to five species a year. But right now, again, scientists propose that we're over a thousand times that. In the past, though, there have been what are called mass extinction events. This is where large numbers of species die off from the planet at once. Usually it takes hundreds to thousands of years for this to happen. Collectively, there's been about five mass extinctions in the past, and scientists propose that we may be living in a sixth mass extinction right now. Again, in a mass extinction, ev extinction event, massive numbers of species are killed off at once, and the fossil record gives us evidence of that. At different times during different mass extinctions, 50 to 95 percent of all species when extinct. Our best known and most recent mass extinction happened 65 million years ago. Scientists propose a gigantic asteroid caused this mass extinction, with, which also killed off the dinosaurs, or at least most of them, where we still have birds and smaller reptiles that survived that one. However, there was a huge mass extinction at what was termed the end of the Permian period, and that was 250 million years ago, where 75 to 95 percent of all species went extinct. Scientists are unsure, but they believe something like massive volcanism in a place like Siberia could have caused this extinction event. Other hypotheses include an asteroid impact, methane release from the oceans and global warming, or even a combination of those factors being the causes. And whatever it is, some scientists nickname this the mother of all extinctions. So again, scientists propose that a sixth human cause mass extinction is actually upon us right now because of population growth and development, resource depletion, altering and destroying natural habitats, over hunting, over grazing, over harvesting, polluting air, water and soil, and the introduction of invasive non-native species to areas are some of the causes of this sixth mass extinction. Biodiversity loss definitely affects humans, as we've said before. We need these other organisms around for food, fiber, medicine, and our ecosystem services. Their loss can affect human survival. Extinction, speciation, and other evolutionary forces play key roles in ecology. Ecology is the scientific study of the interactions among organisms and of the relationships between organisms and their environment. Eco ecology allows us to explain and predict the distribution and abundance of organisms in nature. It's often said that ecology provides the stage on which the play of evolution unfolds. The two are intertwined in many ways. The biosphere is the area of Earth in which life can exist. And ecologists are scientists who study relationships in the biosphere, especially at the higher levels of the hierarchy, namely at the levels of what are called the organism, population, community, ecosystem, 
landscape, and biosphere. Organismal ecology. This is the study of relationships between individuals and their environment. Population ecology investigates population changes. Remember, a population is a group of organisms of the same species living in a similar area who are able to interbreed with each other and produce viable fertile offspring. The distribution and the abundance of the individuals is another part of population ecology and studying why some populations increase and others decrease and their success in certain areas and how they change over time. Community ecology focuses on patterns of species diversity and interaction. A community is different species living in an area. However, because they're in the same area, they interact with one another. Ecosystem ecology studies living and non-living components or biotic and abiotic components of systems to reveal patterns. Landscape ecology explains how and why ecosystems, communities, and populations are distributed across geographic regions. Remember, in the landscape ecology is a geographic region including an array of different ecosystems. There's some words used to describe ecosystem ecology and these other hierarchies. They are habitat. This is the environment where an organism lives. And it also includes the living and non-living elements or the biotic and abiotic elements of that environment. Habitat use is the non-random patterns where organisms live. Habitat selection is the process by which organisms actively select habitats in which to live. And there's different criteria for selecting those habitats such as the food that's available, the shelter, the breeding sites, the mates, and even things like competition with organisms of their same species or different species. When there's competition between the same species, it's called interspecific competition. And when it's competition between different species, it's called intraspecific competition. An organism's survival will definitely depend on having suitable habitats. A niche, or sometimes called a niche, is an organism's functional role in its community. So a habitat is like your address, and a niche, or a niche, is like your job or your career in that habitat. A specialist is an organism that has a very specific niche like the uh, key or the honey creeper from our case study at the start of the chapter. A generalist is an organism that has a broad niche, like the common mina. Populations show features that help predict their dynamics. Predicting a population's growth or decline is useful for managing wildlife and fisheries and for monitoring threatened and endangered species. In our science behind the story, monitoring bird populations at the Hakalau Forest, federal biologists and trained observers conducted periodic surveys of birds on the refuge. Then the researchers analyzed changes in the data through time to make inferences about changes in the population densities and sizes. After reviewing long-term statistical data, Researchers concluded that after 21 years, populations of most native birds were either stable or slowly increasing. This is actually good news. However, data from the most recent nine-year period indicates that the populations may be decreasing, which is not good news. That information here is shown in these graphs below. The population size is the number of individuals present at any given time. It may decrease or increase, may cycle or be stable or remain the same. An example of population decline can be found in passenger pigeons, which were once the most abundant bird in North America, believe it or not, 
but now they are extinct as a result of human interactions. Population density is the number of individuals in a population per unit area. High densities make it easier to find mates, but also increase the interspecific competition and vulnerability to predation. They also can increase the transmission of diseases. This can also be not just for animals and other organisms in the wild, but also can apply to humans as well. As we know, when humans are more dense, densely packed together, diseases are transmitted at a much faster rate. Low densities make it harder to find mates, but the individuals will enjoy more space and more resources. Large organisms usually have low densities, meaning they require many more resources and a larger area to survive. Population distribution describes the spatial arrangement of organisms in an area. It's also called dispersion. We can describe them in three ways. Random, where there's uh, no real pattern to how the individuals are dispersed in a region. Uh, usually in this case, resources are widespread. Uniform, usually due to territoriality or organisms wanting to have a territory or due to competition is when individuals are dispersed evenly, like the penguins in the picture here, all kind of at an arm's length of one another. The most common in nature and the way humans are also dispersed is called clumped. Usually it's because resources are clumped in a certain area, such as around water or around a food source. Other ways to describe populations are by sex ratios and age structure. A population sex ratio is its proportion of males to females in monogamous species in which each sex takes a single mate, a one-to-one -one sex ratio maximizes population growth, whereas an unbalanced ratio leaves many individuals without mate. Most species are not monogamous, however, so sex ratios vary from one species to another. Age structure, or distribution, describes the relative number of individuals of different ages within a population. This helps predict population growth or decline. By combining a population's age structure with data on the reproductive potential of individuals in each age class, a population ecologist can predict whether the population will grow or shrink. In species that continue growing as they age, older individuals reproduce more, such as a tree, and experience makes older individuals better breeders. Human beings are unusual because we often survive past our reproductive years. A human population made up largely of older, post-reproductive individuals will tend to decline over time, whereas one with many young people of reproductive or pre-reproductive age will tend to increase. We'll use diagrams to explore those ideas further in some later chapters as we study human population growth. Understanding the fundamentals of population dynamics in plants and animals gives us a solid basis for studying our own population dynamics and all the pressures, social, cultural, and environmental issues related to human population growth. We'll now take a more quantitative approach to population growth by examining some simple mathematical concepts used by population ecologists and by what are called demographers. Those are scientists that study human populations. Population change is determined by four factors. Natality, those are the births within a population. Mortality are the deaths within a population. Immigration is the arrival of individuals from outside populations. And emigra emigration is the departure of individuals from the population. This could also include deaths. 
which would also remove individuals, while immigration could also include births, which also adds individuals to the population. So once again, the four factors of population change are natality, mortality, immigration, including births and Im immigration, and emigration, which includes deaths and emigration. We can measure a population's rate of natural increase simply by subtracting the death rate from the birth rate. To obtain the population growth rate, which is the total rate of change in a population size per unit time, we must also include the effects of immigration and emigration. It equals the birth rate plus the immigration rate, both of those in parentheses there, minus the death rate plus the emigration rate, both of those in parentheses. The rates in these formulas are often expressed in numbers per 1,000 individuals per year. So, for example, a population with a birth rate of 18 per 1,000 per year, a death rate of 10 per 1,000 per year, an immigration rate of 5 per 1,000 per year, and an emigration rate of 7 per 1,000 per year would have a population growth of 6 per 1,000 per year. And I took that information directly out of your book on page 61, so you can actually see that example of math on page 61, right in the middle of the page. Given those rates, a population of 1,000 in a year will reach 1,006 in the next. If the population is a million, it'll grow to 1,006,000 the next year. Such population increases are often expressed in percentages, which is the population growth rate times 100%. This allows a comparison of populations of different sizes. Unregulated populations increase by exponential growth. When a population increases by a fixed percentage each year, it's said to undergo exponential growth. Imagine you put money in a savings account at a fixed interest rate and you leave it there untouched for years. Each time the principal accrues interest and grows, you can earn still more interest the next time. And the sum grows by escalating amounts each year. The reason is that a fixed percentage of a small number makes for a small increase, but the same percentage of a larger number produces a larger increase. Thus, as saving accounts or populations grow larger, each incremental increase of the same percent becomes larger in absolute terms. Such acceleration is characteristic of exponential growth. When it's graphed, you can recognize exponential growth by a J-curved graph or a J-shaped curve graph. It often occurs in nature with small populations where there's low competition and ideal conditions. Most often these circumstances hold when the organism arrives in a new environment containing abundant resources, like mold growing on a piece of fruit or bacteria decomposing a dead animal. Those are some great examples. Also plants colonizing regions during primary succession after glac glaciers have receded or volcanoes have erupted. In Hawaii, many species that colonized the islands underwent exponential growth for a time after their arrival. One current example of exponential growth in North America is the Eurasian collared dove that we see in the picture below. Unlike the extinct relative of this dove, the passenger pigeon, this species arrived here from Europe and thrives in human disturbed areas and has spread across the continent in a matter of years. Exponential growth, though, rarely lasts. After all, there's only so many resources in an area that can support only so many individuals. Limiting factors are those that limit population growth. They can be physical, chemical, and biological. They could be things like food and resources, 
or not having enough shelter or having too much competition or not enough nutrients or nitrogen in an area. Carrying capacity is the maximum of the population size of a species that a specific environment can sustain. Often it's designated by a capital K. Another pattern that we may see in population growth is logistic growth, shown on a graph by a logistic growth curve. It's an S-shaped curve, and it shows how limiting factors slow and stop exponential growth, like we see here. Here we're asked to predict the population growth rate of the Eurasian, Eurasian collared dove. They first showed up in Florida and then spread across the United States, much like other birds have done, such as the sparrow and the European star, starling. Uh, they peaked, but today are beginning to decline. So we may predict that that too will happen to the Eurasian collared dove. And instead of seeing the exponential growth, we may much more see the logistic growth going from the J-shaped curve to the S-shaped curve. Limiting factors can restrain population growth. And these limiting factors are divided into two categories. One category is called density-dependent factors. Those are limiting factors whose influence is affected by population density. Increased density increases the risk of predation, competition for mates, and disease, and results in the logistic growth curve. Environmental resistance has a stronger effect on larger populations. Some density-dependent factors, for example, may be competition and food source and disease those types of limiting factors can slow a population growth. Density independent factors are limiting factors whose influence is not affected by the population density. Oftentimes they're much more environmental, such as temperature extremes, floods, fires, landslides, tsunamis, volcanoes, and etc. It's almost like it, it's not the population's fault that those things are happening. Those are processes of the earth that they must deal with, but nevertheless are still limiting factors that can influence their population growth. Carrying capacities, the amount of individuals that an environment can hold, can change. Environments are complex and ever-changing, therefore the carrying capacity can change as well. Humans lower environmental resistance for ourselves, and we increase our carrying capacity. Technologies is, have overcome the limiting factors against us, and we've appropriated immense amounts of resources. Therefore, it's really hard to define what actually is carrying capacities for humans on Earth. We've also reduced the carrying capacity for countless other organisms, calling into question our own long-term survival. Here's some questions that the book asks us about carrying capacity in human, human populations. I will say that later on in our textbook and in our course, we'll take a look specifically at human populations. But until then, here's some questions to consider. Name some specific means by which we have apparently raised Earth's carrying capacity for our species. So an example there might be like technology and medical advances or agriculture that allow us to make more food for ourselves. Do you think we can continue to raise our carrying capacity and how might we do so? Are the ways in which we might accommodate more people in the future the same as the ways in which we have expanded our population so far? What limiting factors exist in our population today? And might the Earth's carrying capacity decrease? Why or why not? 
So again, those are some questions to consider until we get to our chapter on human population. Conservation biodiversity. Human development, resource extraction, and population pressures are speeding up the rate of environmental change. And committed people are taking action to safeguard biodiversity and restore ecological and evolutionary processes. Here's some innovative solutions that are working for our case study for the chapter in Hawaii. Ranch land is being restored to forest, invasive plants are being removed and native ones are being planted. Animals are being protected while new populations are being established. Across Hawaii, people are protecting land and restoring native habitat and protecting areas offshore. Ecoterrorism is another thing that helps if Hawaii residents keep their ecosystems natural, it actually helps bring people in to see these areas and actually helps the Hawaiian economy, which then benefits Hawaii's resident residents for these conservation efforts. Climate change though pro poses an extra challenge Global climate change now threatens conservation biology efforts, unfortunately. Change in temperature alters many of the aspects of the environments and protected areas can become unsuitable for the species being protected. Scientists and managers need to come up with new ways to help save declining populations. In conclusion, the fundamentals of evolution and population ecology are integral to environmental science. Natural selection, speciation, and extinction help determine Earth's biodiversity. As humans, we need to have a knowledge of these processes in order to understand environmental science and to come up with solutions today. Understanding how ecological processes function at the population level is crucial to protecting biodiversity.